Let's now discuss the nerve and blood supply of the kidney. The nerve supply of the kidney is via the sympathetic fibers, and we're going to refer to them as the vasomotor fibers that emerge from the renal plexus. The renal plexus is one of the visceral plexuses found in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And what they will do, these vasomotor fibers or sympathetic fibers, is they will adjust the rate of urine formation. Or in other words, they will adjust the rate of formation of urine by regulating or changing blood flow and blood pressure, something that we're going to look at when we get to the physiology of the kidneys or the urinary system, as well as stimulate the release of renin. What renin does is it increases the reabsorption of sodium ions and water. Once again, the details will be discussed in the physiology of the urinary system. The blood supply of the kidney is quite extensive. Each kidney will not only clean, it'll filter, process that blood, and adjust its composition. So therefore, it has an extremely rich blood supply. And the artery that delivers that blood to the kidneys are the renal arteries. So we have two renal arteries, one on the right and one on the left. And they deliver about one-fourth of blood. So that's about 1,200 milliliters of blood per minute to both kidneys. So that's 1.2 liters of blood per minute, which is quite amazing for organs that are about, again, the size of a bar of soap. So what we're now going to do is look at blood flow into the kidney and out of the kidney. So as was previously discussed, the renal artery directly branches off of the abdominal aorta. So this renal artery will deliver blood into the kidney, and that blood is to be filtered and processed by the kidney. So typical of the arterial system or the arterial tree, we diverge into smaller and smaller arteries until we eventually arrive at the arteriole and then into the capillary. And then from there, we converge in the venous tree or the venous system. Blood enters via the renal artery into the kidney, and then it diverges into the segmental artery. And these segmental arteries can be found in the renal sinus. And in fact, they're going to run alongside the segmental vein, just as the renal artery will run alongside the renal vein. So they go hand in hand. Uh, from the segmental artery, once again, we find it in the renal sinus alongside the segmental vein. From there, it diverges into the interlobar artery. Where do we find these interlobar arteries? We find them in the renal columns alongside the interlobar vein. And then the interlobar artery will diverge into the arcuate artery. Now, why is it called arcuate? Because, folks, it arches over, all right? So arcuate for arch. So it arches over the base of this renal pyramid. And once again, the arcuate artery will along, run alongside the arcuate vein. Then blood drains into the cortical radiate artery. So that then ascends into the renal cortex. All right, so the cortical radiate artery runs alongside the cortical radiate vein. From the cortical radiate artery, blood then drains into the afferent arteriole. Then from the afferent arteriole into this glomerulus. And what I'd like you to do is instead of putting glomerulus here, and I'll put an asterisk, is let's change that to glomerular capillary. And I'll explain why later. All right, glomerular capillary, which you'll see is basically part of the glomerulus, but we're going to modify that to glomerular cap capillary. Then blood drains into the efferent arteriole, all right? Efferent arteriole. Now, the efferent arteriole will drain blood into the peritubular capillaries. It also may drain blood into the vasa recta, all right? And I say may because this is not a given. So you'll see why this is the case. So in other words, there may not always be a vasa recta to begin with. But again, we'll approach that or we'll talk about that later. All right, so from efferent arteriole, it will drain into the peritubular capillary and or into the vasa recta. From the peritubular capillary, then we continue to converge into the cortical radiate vein. Where do we find that? Alongside the cortical radiate artery. Then into the arcuate vein, once again, along the arch, all right, it arches over, as I'm shading here in blue, 
over the base of the renal pyramid. Then blood drains into the interlobar vein. So where do we find the interlobar vein? In the renal column alongside the interlobar artery. Then we continue to converge into the segmental vein, once again in the renal sinus alongside the segmental artery, draining into the renal vein. All right, And the renal vein, as you can see over here, basically runs alongside the renal artery. Now, as far as the renal vein is concerned, this blood that is traveling through that renal vein has already been processed by the kidney. All right, it's been filtered by the kidney. It just so happens to be deoxygenated blood. The renal vein then drains into the inferior vena cava. All right, so this is an illustration that I did that shows part of the uh, blood flow into and out of the kidney. So before we get into the discussion of these blood vessels, let's just figure out where we're at here as far as the kidney is concerned. So here is my renal capsule, right? My renal capsule, and if we go deep, we have the segment called the renal cortex. And then if we go deeper, then we have the renal medulla. And um, the lecture videos mention that the renal medulla, we find these renal pyramids, sort of like an upside down pyramid, basically. And uh, from the renal medulla, then we lead into the renal pelvis. All right, so let's look at the uh, first blood vessel that's in this illustration, and it's this one right over here. So this is what we refer to as the interlobar artery. So I mentioned in the previous video that the interlobar artery is found in these renal columns. So these renal columns, which are invaginations of the renal cortex, by the way, are between these upside down, or I should say are in between the renal pyramids. So here is my interlobar artery, and of course the blood that drains into the interlobar artery has come from the segmental artery. So this illustration is not showing us the incoming blood via the renal artery, and then it diverges into the segmental artery, and then it diverges into the interlobar artery, which is what this is right over here, okay? And so blood continues circulating up through the interlobar artery, and then of course we diverge into the next artery that we refer to as the arcuate artery. So this thing will arch over the renal pyramid, specifically the base of the renal pyramid. That's why it's called the arcuate artery. So basically this arcuate artery is literally running at the junction between the renal cortex and the renal medulla. And then from there, blood continues to flow into the cortical radiate artery, all right? So now this cortical radiate artery is now strictly in the renal cortex. Then it drains into the afferent arteriole, all right, right over here. This is the afferent arteriole. Then blood flows into the glomerular capillary. So this glomerular capillary, as you'll see later on, is part of what we call the glomerulus. So once again, to be discussed later. Then blood flows into now the efferent arteriole. All right, so this right here is the efferent arteriole. All right, so now blood has two pathways that it can drain into, all right? The first of which is this right over here. So what is this? This is what's called the peritubular capillary, all right? So peritubular capillary capillary. And this peritubular capillary, once again, is in the renal cortex. However, another possible pathway that blood can drain into from this efferent arteriole is another capillary, which is this right over here. This is called the vasa recta. All right, so this capillary bed right here is referred to as the vasa recta. Well, where do we find these vasa recta? Well, we find them in the renal medulla. All right, so if we want to look for the vasa recta, then you need to look into the renal medulla. All right, now please note that it does not necessarily have to drain into the vasa recta. That's not a given. Uh, you'll see this later on when we talk about the two different types of nephrons, so more to come. So blood drains into the peritubular capillary and or the vasa recta. From here, blood drains from the peritubular capillary into this structure right over here. This is the cortical radiate vein, all right? The cortical radiate vein. 
Now, what about the vasa recta? Well, the vasa recta can also drain that blood into the cortical radiate vein. However, it has also another option or another pathway in which the blood can drain into, and that is this vein right here. This is your arcuate vein. All right, so as far as the vasa recta is concerned, it can drain venous blood into the cortical radiate vein and or the arcuate vein. So just like the arcuate artery, this arcuate vein is found at the junction of the renal cortex and the renal medulla along the base of this renal pyramid. And then blood drains into this interlobar vein. All right, and then from the interlobar vein, blood continues its journey now this time into the segmental vein and out via the renal vein. Now the way I've illustrated this out is remember that these uh, veins and arteries run alongside each other. So the reason why it looks like this is because I spread them out. So you can just imagine that this is like a closed book. All right, so uh, the book has been closed and then you're spreading open the book. You've opened the book. And this is essentially what you see if we do that. So one last thing I wanna mention before we move on to the next slide is where are these blood vessels located? All right, so as far as the cortical radiate artery and the afferent arteriole, the glomerular capillary, which again is part of the glomerulus, the efferent arteriole, as well as the peritubular capillaries, and of course the cortical radiate, a vein, these vessels are found in the renal cortex, all right? So that's an important thing to remember. Now, as far as the arcuate artery and the arcuate vein, as I said, that is found in, in between the two layers. In other words, at the junction between the renal cortex and the renal medulla, just along the surface of the renal base, which is part of the renal pyramid. Now, what about the vasa recta? The vasa recta is found in the renal medulla. So please remember the locations of these vessels. So this will come into discussion when we talk about the physiology of the uh, kidney or the urinary system. So from the kidney, urine drains into the ureters. We have two ureters, one on the right and one on the left. These are slender tubes that convey urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. And it begins roughly at the L2 vertebra as a continuation of the renal pelvis. It lies retroperitoneal, meaning it's behind the peritoneum. It enters the base of the urinary bladder through the posterior wall of the urinary bladder. So if we make a quick drawing of the urinary bladder right over here, obviously this is not the complete picture, and this is anterior, and this is posterior the ureters actually come from the back. So they connect to the urinary bladder at the posterior wall of the urinary bladder. As the bladder fills with urine, pressure builds, which then causes the distal ends of the ureters to close. And that will prevent the backflow of urine from the urinary bladder into the uh, ureters and then potentially back up into the uh, kidneys. So as far as the layers of the wall of the ureter, we have three. We have your mucosa, and of course the mucosa is in direct contact with the lumen, and it consists of the epithelial tissue, basement membrane, and the lamina propria. And the uh, type of epithelial tissue is transitional, the second layer is the muscularis. So the muscularis is consisting of smooth muscle, of course, uh, the inner longitudinal layer and the outer circular layer. So as far as the muscularis layer of the ureter, it's the opposite of what we find with the muscularis externa of the GI tract, whereby the inner layer is circular and the outer layer is longitudinal. And they will contract in response to stretch. So if it stretches with urine, then automatically it undergoes peristalsis. So peristalsis, just as what we talked about with the GI tract, this is meant to propel the urine that's coming from the kidneys into the urinary bladder. 
Now, the rate of peristalsis, or these rhythmic contractions, which are made possible because, of course, we have the muscularis layer, is dependent upon how much urine is being formed at a given period of time. So, in other words, if the rate of urine formation increases, that means more urine flows into the ureter, then we have more of these rhythmic peristaltic waves. And again, the whole point is so that it delivers that urine into the urinary bladder. The final layer is the adventitia. And that adventitia is made up of dense, fibrous, collagenous connective tissue. The next organ of the urinary system is the urinary bladder. It's a hollow, distentable muscular sac for the temporary storage of urine. So it lies on the pelvic floor, just posterior to the pubic symphysis. So if we look at the sagittal section of the female, here is the pubic symphysis, and of course this is fibrocartilage. And then in the male, here is the pubic symphysis, so you can see that the urinary bladder lies posterior to the pubic symphysis. In males, there is a gland called the prostate gland that lies inferior to the neck of the bladder. And you can see it right over here. If we look internally, we see that we have three openings in the urinary bladder. So we have the two urethral openings, and this is where urine that's coming from the ureter drains into the urinary bladder. Then we have another hole over here, and that's called the internal urethral orifice. So if we connect the, the openings together, then we form this triangular shaped region or area called the trigone. So this smooth triangular area is outlined by the openings for both the ureters and the urethra. So this trigone, this area, has a funnel shapeness to it, and that helps essentially funnel the urine from the urinary bladder into the urethra. All right, so let's now look at the wall of the urinary bladder. We have the mucosa. So the mucosa, and that mucosa is directly facing the lumen. The type of epithelial tissue is transitional and anchored to a basement membrane, and deep to that is our lamina propria. The next layer is the submucosa. So this layer, the submucosa, I want to briefly mention that not all AMP books will consider this as a layer. Right, so I want you to be aware of that. So keep that in mind. So depending upon which AMP book you look at, they may not define the submucosa as a separate layer that's part of the wall of the bladder. They consider the lamina propria essentially as that submucosa. Now I will go ahead and mention the submucosa and I will go ahead and consider it as the one of the layers of the wall of the bladder. Then we have our muscularis layer. And this consists of three layers of smooth muscle. So we have the inner and outer layers that are longitudinally arranged smooth muscle, sandwiching the middle layer, which is circularly arranged. So these three groups or three layers of smooth muscle taken together is referred to as the detrusor muscle. Then we have the adventitia, the outermost layer, and this is made up of areolar connective tissue. We look at the superior part of the urinary bladder. Uh, it's covered sort of like it's draped over with the peritoneum. And because of this, the urinary bladder is considered to be infraperitoneal. That means it lies inferior to the peritoneum. Now, if we look into the internal surface, of the urinary bladder, you can see that it has these rugi, all right, similar to the rugi of the stomach. And what happens here is when the urinary bladder expands or stretches or distends when it's full of urine, these rugi will disappear, all right? So this essentially allows for that free expansion of the urinary bladder as it continues to collect urine that's coming from the kidneys via the ureters. So let's now talk about what's called the urine storage capacity of the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder, as was mentioned, is a muscular sac. And in fact, it will collapse when it's empty with urine. And this is where we see the rugi reappear when the urinary bladder is empty. It will expand, obviously, when it fills with urine, and it rises superiorly as it collects that urine. However, there isn't going to be a significant rise in the internal pressure of the abdominal pelvic cavity. 
Now, a moderately full bladder is about five inches in length, and it can hold approximately 500 milliliters or half a liter of urine. Now, it can hold twice that amount if necessary. However, it can rupture if it's overstretched or over distended. So let's now talk about a reflex called the micturition reflex. Now, micturition is just another way of saying urination or avoiding. So what we find in the bladder wall or the wall of the bladder are stretch receptors, mechanoreceptors that will detect the stretching of the urinary bladder. So what has to happen for us to urinate are three simultaneous events. Event number one, the contraction of the detrusor muscle, and this is regulated by the autonomic nervous system. Number two, the opening of the internal urethral sphincter, also regulated or controlled by the ANS. The third event is the opening of what's called the external urethral sphincter by the SNS, the somatic nervous system. So let's now talk about reflexive urination. So this is seen in babies and also seen in very, very young children and whereby they don't yet have the ability to control uh, their urination. In other words, they can't hold it, so to speak. And what happens here is when the stretching of the urinary bladder occurs, it activates the stretch receptors. And what that will do is it'll automatically lead to the contraction of those detrusor muscles and as well as the relaxation of the internal urethral sphincter. The detrusor muscle and the internal urethral sphincter are both smooth muscle. Now what we also see is inhibition of the somatic motor pathways. In other words, it will lead to the relaxation of the external urethral sphincter. And this external urethral sphincter is skeletal muscle. So by inhibiting those somatic motor neurons, essentially, the individual cannot once again hold the urge to urinate. So because of this, as soon as their bladder gets to a certain volume, they will automatically urinate. They don't have the ability to so-called hold it. So this is seen once again in babies and seen in very, very young children. We have what's called the pontine control centers that mature around the ages of two and three. So this pontine control centers consists of the pontine storage center that inhibits micturition and the pontine micturition center that promotes micturition. So what we'll do to get a better understanding of this micturition reflex, we'll look at the next slide that diagrams this out for us.